the jaw jerk reflex is uh, one of those reflexes, it's also known as the masseteric reflex, involving the brain stem. It's not commonly used, but there is a certain expectation of knowledge and understanding about this reflex and what it means, which confuses students. And of course, we're talking about upper motor neuron lesions here again, which is probably what causes the confusions and a little bit of a fear about this reflex. So, what does this reflex test? What is the anatomy of this reflex? What can you use it for? And most importantly, what should you know about it, I guess? When you bite, when you close your jaw, you're using your masseter muscles and your, tempor your temporalis muscles, right? to elevate your jaw, to bite your teeth together. And the jaw jerk reflex test, really, it's a, a stretch reflex test, just like you see when you do a biceps tendon test or a triceps tendon test or a brachioradialis tendon test. It's the same principle, but now we're in the face, we're testing a cranial nerve, it lets us test the level of a lesion when we've already got some suspicions about a patient, where tests have already told us about uh, something about what's going on, right? So what you're doing really then is, you, so you put your finger on the, on the jaw, between the chin and the lip, and then you tap your finger, <laughs> not when the patient's talking, yeah, the patient is relaxed, the mouth is partially open, you tap your finger and that stretches the masseter muscle, which is why this is called the masseteric reflex, and then the reflex arc triggers masseter to contract. Now, actually, in a normal healthy person, there may be no reflex, or it may be a very small, you know, tensing, closing of the mouth. Not fully closed, just a little bit of an elevation of the jaw. That is normal. The abnormal response you're looking for is a brisk reflex. Um, a, a, a stronger than normal re reflex, where you tap and the, the jaw elevates quite rapidly and maybe the mouth closes. That tells you something. But what is the anatomy here? What is going on? Okay, so on big head, there's the masseter muscle, there's temporalis. So what you're doing is then stretching the masseter muscle so there are stretch receptors in the muscle that are detecting that stress. That's the first part of the reflex. And um, the muscles of mastication are innervated by the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, and they're innervated by the third branch, the mandibular branch, which makes sense because we're moving the mandible. So the, the sensory input, stretch receptors in the muscle, uh, and the sensory nerve, the afferent nerve, is the um, mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, which will run up here through the oval foramen, and then there we see it entering the cranial cavity with the other two branches of the trigeminal nerve. So there's the trigeminal nerve there. We can see this here. So there's the mandible. Part of the mandible has been taken away. And in there, we can see the branches of the mandibular nerve coming together. They have a few jobs to do. Some of them are coming from the masseter muscle and they're coming together to form the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. This is the skull here, so it passes through the oval foramen and has entered the cranial cavity in there. Now, the trigeminal nerve is an interesting nerve because it is the major sensory nerve of the face. Most of its job is carrying sensory innovation, sensory information from structures in the face. So it's a big nerve uh, and its motor job is just a small part of that. But we're talking about something different. We're talking about a sensory part of a motor part of a trigeminal nerve. Anyway, um, so here's the brain, here's the brain stem, there's the medulla oblongata, there's the pond. So the big nerve we see entering here is the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve enters the pons and its fibers split off and go to different nuclei. So most of those are sensory fibers. 
We're not talking about the motor fibers yet, remember, we're talking about sensory fibers coming from the masseter muscle, for example, and these go somewhere special. These fibers run into the pons and then they ascend up into the, the midbrain up here to the level of the superior colliculus and they run to the trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus. It's a very straightforward name. It's trigeminal, yes. Mesencephalic literally means midbrain, and this is a nucleus in the midbrain. And the trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus is receiving proprioceptive fibers. That's interesting because it's a little bit special. Well, what are we normally doing here? Well, we're normally biting. And we can generate quite high forces when we bite. And the trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus is receiving proprioceptive forces, not just about the jaw position and the lengths of the muscles moving the jaw, but also I think information from the periodontal ligament, which is the ligament that attaches your tooth to the bone. So the purpose of the trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus is so that you don't bite so hard that you break yourself. It stops you from breaking your own teeth, for example. So this nucleus receives proprioceptive input that then modulates the movements of the jaw so that you don't hurt yourself. Pretty cool, huh? And if you want to go one layer even nerdier, so the trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus, it's a sensory nucleus, but its nerve cell bodies are actually in the midbrain, in the central nervous system, which is very unusual because most sensory nerves that go to the central nervous system, they have a ganglion outside the central nervous system, which is where they keep their nerve cell bodies and then they send an axon off to the sensory target and they send a neuron back into the, sensory, into the central nervous system. The trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus is different and yet it is still formed from neural crest cells. Back on topic, so the relay then is that proprioceptive input comes into the trigeminal mesencephalic nucleus and fibers then relay to the trigeminal motor nucleus, which is in the pons, not very far away. And the trigeminal motor nucleus, here we have the nerve cell bodies of neurons that are gonna send their axons out to the muscles of mastication, so to the masseter and temporalis muscles in terms of closing the jaw, right? So these are somatic motor neurons. These are lower motor neurons, actually, because they're going out of the central nervous system to the muscle. So, uh, and we've already seen their route because the route back out to these muscles is the same as the route back in again. The sensory inputs take the same path as the motor outputs, but the reflex is in here. So how does this anatomy help us work out what's going on in our patient? Well, we're concerned that there is an upper motor neuron lesion. So you've performed reflex tests on other tendons. Uh, and remember that um, the lower motor neuron then is the, uh, is, the, is the neuron in the peripheral nervous system that's running to the muscle. So if that lower motor neuron has been cut, the muscle will not contract, the reflex will be absent. Um, but when you test a reflex, um, you're testing the sensory input, the reflex, say in the spinal cord, and then the motor output, you're testing that that's intact, but the upper motor neurons, the effect they have on that reflex is to dampen it. So an upper motor neuron is running from the cerebrum um, through the brain, to the brainstem or to the spinal cord. So when you think about making a movement, the upper motor neuron takes that action potential, sends it onto the lower motor neuron and you make the movement, right? But in terms of you testing reflexes, the upper motor neuron normally dampens the reflex. When you test the reflex, the reflex is, is, is you know, sensible, which is why I said when you do the jaw jerk reflex test in normal people, the reflex may be small or absent because that upper motor neuron dampening effect is keeping it dampened. It's just moderating all of this. So if the upper motor neuron is injured, that dampening effect is lost. And if the, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve is intact, then when you do the jaw jerk reflex test, when you stretch that muscle rapidly and the reflex causes the muscle to contract and it causes it to contract rapidly, 
If the upper motor neuron is not present to dampen that reflex, it will be brisker than normal, right? And that's, that's what deep tendon reflex testing is doing in other parts of the body. So you have a patient, you've done tests elsewhere, you've determined that there is an upper motor neuron lesion, but you're not sure where that upper motor neuron lesion is. Now, if the, if the lesion is in the spinal cord, say in the cervical spinal cord, so that structures distal to that are affected by the lesion here, if you were to then test the jaw jerk reflex test, the upper motor neurons running from here to the, uh, the um, trigeminal motor nucleus, that would be intact. So if the injury was in the spinal cord, then the jaw jerk reflex test would be normal. But if the upper motor neuron lesion is above the level of the trigeminal motor nucleus, so above the level of, say, the pons or the midbrain, then the jaw, jaw jerk reflex test would be brisk, right? Because the upper motor neuron is injured up here. We're talking about pyramidal tracts. The pyramidal tracts are carrying those upper motor neurons from the cerebrum to the brainstem, that would be the corticobulbar tract, or to the spinal cord, that would be the corticospinal tract. Um, also, this um, jaw jerk reflex with the trigeminal nerve, it doesn't cross sides, it's on only on one side at a time, which might have an effect on how the jaw moves, right? How's that? Did that make sense? The jaw jerk reflex test is like a tendon reflex test elsewhere in the body, but it lets you test the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, or more accurately, it lets you test the upper motor neurons superior to the, motor, the trigeminal motor nucleus and see if they're intact. If the reflex is normal, then it's likely that the upper motor neurons superior to the trigeminal motor nucleus in the pons are fine. Um, and you will likely be using this alongside other examinations that you've been doing to help give you more information about what's going on inside the patient. But there you go, the uh, masseteric reflex or jaw jerk reflex test. Um, interesting, I like that one. See you next week.